Good morning, everybody. It's great to see you. Uh, good to be back um, with the church family that I grew up in. And um, I've been asked to talk about this uh, topic of bridge builders, and I suppose the thought was really to talk about um, reaching out to other communities across cultures and things like that. But I really felt to have a focus too about um, building bridges when we have um, differences, uh, even of opinion or arguments or things like that. Because the world's shifted since I was, uh, you know, you, you young fellas here, when I, when I was your age, we didn't have mobile phones and stuff like that. So, um, you know, the game's changed, um, but the, the authentic um, call to live out a Christian life hasn't. And so it's good to get back to that. Um, I suppose social media has meant that we are more connected as a global community, um, more than ever before, and yet we seem more partisan and tribal. Um, you know, it's an era where anyone can have a voice, but um, listening and enacting seems to be a bit of a dying art. And um, so we want to kind of reclaim those spaces. Um, we want to get back to an authentic gospel um, and building bridges can help us. Um, if we just go to the first uh, slide there, please. Um, it's not Declan, is it? So I'll just say hi. Morning. <laughs> um, the gospel message is really pretty simple when you break it down to its core. And it's all about building bridges. And um, if we just go to the next slide there. Um, the great commandments that Jesus talked about. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. All right, loving God, loving others. And then the great commission is that we're to go out into all the world with that good news, okay? The really good news is that it's not all up to us because God's already done it. Okay, he's already reached out. He's already built the bridge. He's made the way. He's crossed it. He's with us. He's done all the hard work. And all we need to do is to mirror or to emulate the work that God's already done in, on the earth and in us and through us. So we are made for relationship with God. God has sought us out since the beginning. And, and as I was doing some reading around this topic, I thought this was a, a cute little, um, almost like a love story. But <clears throat> this, this was the moment in social media terms where um, Adam and Eve unfriended God. Okay, And the reason they did that was because they did the wrong thing. And so they hid from him. Okay, So in Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the earth, he makes Adam and Eve, he sets some guidelines, they break it. And the first thing they do is to hide. Genesis 3 verse 8, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So they're hiding, but the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? So he's already in search of Adam and Eve, even though... They were the ones that did the wrong thing. And they're the ones trying to hide. God's still going after them. And he's calling out after them. It's a pretty early example, isn't it, of God building a bridge back to us, even though we're trying to cross rivers and <laughs> gorges and gullies to get away from him. He's building his way back and he is calling us. It's a nice little example. And this is the, the interesting thing. So, you know, there were consequences in, in that story that, um, God lays out. But then in verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Not only did he come back, he made something because they suddenly became aware of their nakedness and they were ashamed. And God even provided for them in that situation, which was of their own making. It's a pretty amazing God that we have. And 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us okay so that's the kind of love that we're talking about when we say there's a good news story and that we should take that to all the world so if we look at in the church um, some examples or instructions uh, to each other we're called to love others philippians 3 verse 3 to 4 
do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. John 13, 34, 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I've loved you, you're also to love one another. So he lays the model, he builds the bridge, he crosses it, but we can mirror and emulate what God's doing in the earth. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. 1 Peter 4, 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. So this is a pretty good model for us here in the church, in your church community, that we're humble, that we put others' interests ahead of ourselves, that we are known that we're marked by the enactment of love towards our brothers and our sisters, and that we cover each other, even if it's a problem of somebody else's making, we cover them. That's what God did. He went. And I, I'd love to know what the fashion range looked like, actually. The garment made out of skins that God made for Adam and Eve. I think you could probably get someone to market that, couldn't you? But that's the positioning or the attitude or the stance that we in the church family and community can take. Humility, putting each other first, covering each other in our differences, and that is reclaiming an authentic gospel, a message of love. This is the archive that we need. And, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about social media and, and the internet because it's so easy to go there to that archive to get knowledge about anything. You want an answer? Hey, Google, or hey, Suri, or, you know, Google it. All right, but that is not an authentic gospel source. That's not the archive that's going to tell you about who you are and who you're meant to become. God's word is the archive, and we've got to find our way back to a more unfiltered uh, interaction with the gospel, God's word. So when we talk about this commissioning, this going out with this good news in the world, we need to know how to deal with differences and to deal with difference. You might call that doing justice. Uh, when Bob Hawke, uh, who was a former Prime Minister, died, I was interested to see a quote. His father was a minister, and a little message came up, and one of his famous lines was that belief in the fatherhood of God necessarily involves believing in the brotherhood of man. Can we just go to that next slide there, please? Okay, so if, if you can accept that God is our Father, then you need to see that the earth is full of your brothers and sisters. And that's it. Okay? That changes our lens on who is us and who's them. Because we're all us, according to God. We're all God's children. In the Old Testament, this, there's this word justice, mishpat, which in one sense is about equitable distribution of the law. You know, we can, we've got a justice system, for example, um, and that's one lens, but it's not the only, only lens. Uh, when, when we teach the Pidendata Language Summer School here in Adelaide, we say, poor old English. <laughs> it can't, poor old English, it can't understand the richness of other languages. Uh, we get a bit stuck. And, and this is a good example where the word justice has a lot of depth and range, and prisms, colour, and justice just doesn't do it justice, okay? And we need to reclaim justice for the church and for Christian mission. And that's what I'm arguing this morning. And Mishpat is also but mainly about taking up the cause and care of widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, that's what justice is all about. Micah 6, 8, he's shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you to act justly? That is to enact justice, to enact mishpat, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That's a pretty good charter, isn't it? That's a good one for the kitchen or the toilet door, I think. Um, 
And there's another word which relates to justice, and uh, that's tzadikwa. And it actually is often translated as righteous or righteousness. And that's about being in right relationship with God and right relationship with others. But it's also justice. And it's actually also charity. So that's a good one to think about. Okay, if being righteous is about being right before God and right with our brothers and sisters, but it's also about enacting justice and charity, that's a good one to think about what that means for us in our life. For example, um, what if uncharitable, being uncharitable also means that we're being unrighteous? That sort of flips your thinking a little bit, doesn't it? Or on the flip side of that, is mere charity enough? You know, is sponsoring a kid or, uh, you know, giving to um, Vinnie's or, um, you know, taking your clothes to the bin when you don't want them anymore, is that enough? Is that enacting justice according to God's model? Well, it may be a prism, but it's not everything. And so we need to explore this a little bit more. Um, what, at, what attitude and actions does the Lord require of you? as you walk humbly with your God. I think that's a good reflection point. Tim Keller, in his book, Generous Justice, he says, biblical righteousness is inevitably social because it's about relationships. In the Bible, tzadikwa refers to day-to-day -day living in, a, in uh, which a person conducts all relationships in family and society with fairness, generosity and equity. It's not surprising then to discover that Sedequa and Mishpat are brought together scores of times in the Bible. So, for example, Psalm 33, verse 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Another way to translate that is to say that the Lord loves social justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. And so, as Christians, part of our bridge building in response to God's bridge building back towards us is to enact a God-ordained social justice. But how do we know what's authentic justice according to the Bible? And some of this is about reclaiming language, okay? So, uh, you know, I, I'm an equity scholar, you might say, at UniSA, and, um, you know, we, we work in that space of social justice. If you're on social media, you probably know what social justice warriors are, right? That's when you... Uh, when you um, kind of like to rubbish people who uh, say this or that. Or um, another one is um, virtue signalling. Uh, now, they're, they're sort of pejorative terms or put-downs. Uh, but I think that's because this language of doing justice has kind of been taken on outside of a biblical context and made into something else. Okay? But God's word was the first authentic archive about enacting justice on this earth. And actually social justice is in the Old Testament dozens of times. So it was God's idea. And there is a powerful, powerful charter and a manuscript in the Bible. You should get to know it. It's great. And this is the problem, I suppose, of going to the archive and living in a virtual world. Well, you don't really need to bridge to anywhere. You've just got to log on. And that me, it becomes about me and it gets in the way of loving others. Tim Keller says, living a self-absorbed life will always be at the cost of everyone else. So living out the great command, that's loving God and loving others. And the great commission is that we should take that good news of what God's done for us. The, he's made a way to us. We should take that out to the world. That's about breaking down walls and building bridges, but it requires dislocation and movement. And I've used those words quite specifically. If you watched the Richmond football game the other night and watched that poor bloke drag himself off the field with a dislocated shoulder, it looks very, very painful. I uh, hope it hasn't happened to you. Um, but I'm not talking about dislocating your shoulder. Um, what I am saying is that if you're stuck in a certain position... It may be that you need to uproot and relocate and see something from another perspective or be in another space. 
And that requires movement. That requires a going out. Uh, but it's very, very important. We sang a song before, and I don't know the song, so I don't even know the name, but it kind of places us at that moment of the Good Friday story, right? You remember that one? About what's happening as Jesus is dying on the cross. There's a lot of amazing stuff happening, but there's something else, okay? If we just go to the next slide, please, and that is that Matthew 27, 51, this is at the moment that Jesus cries out, and uh, gives up his life. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. This is powerful. But it's also a powerful image. It's telling us something. This curtain is not a shower curtain. It's not something you can go down to Bunnings and get tin snips and cut. It's immense. Okay? Not even the power team guys that rip open phone books could tear this curtain it's something supernatural it's God's power and what that's absolutely telling us is that God's favour and our access to an intimate relationship with him is open to all because before you'd have to have someone else go on your behalf into that space there was a wall There was a limitation and Jesus split it from top to bottom and he says, all belong. All are my children. You are all brothers and sisters. You don't need someone else who has special access to come to me. You got it. Right? Here it is. It's open. The way into the Holy of Holies was open for all time, for all people, both Jew and and Gentile, and this was something that the early church got hung up on. Okay, the early church, Jesus comes, they get the gospel, they begin to meet, but they're caught between whether they need to enact Jewish law in order to be right with God, or whether Gentiles who do not observe Jewish law can be equals at the table. Who's us and who's them? And as we'll see soon, this question plays out. And the church is in dialogue with themselves and with each other about making sense of this all. So I don't know if you've noticed, but our world's currently a bit hung up with this question of who's us and who's them. Historically, the church has led social change towards biblical justice. And more than ever, our community, our world, needs Christians who will take Mishpat seriously, enacting justice. Key ideas about righteousness, relational right standing with God, others, justice, charity. We need to be at the front. We need to be reclaiming what enacting justice means. It's really important. The world needs Christians and churches who are willing to cross divides and build bridges rather than getting caught up in the business of maintaining walls and border work. And so the theme that I've been given is building bridges. And, you know, you need bridges when there's a gulf or a divide or a moat or a huge river and you're full of crocodiles or something you can't get across. Someone's got to build a bridge, right? But first, someone has to go out to the other side and start making a way. Once that bridge is there, both sides can move back and across. So walls are built to keep others out. And they're opposite in nature to bridges. I just want to go back to dislocation and movement for a moment. Opening the gates, moving out from behind the wall, building bridges, it's risky business. It costs. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes you lose. Sometimes you don't always win. You know, stepping out from what's comfortable and turning yourself inside out and allowing yourself to be seen in the gaze of another, sometimes if they're angry or don't understand you, there's a risk that can be painful. You know, there are certain type of seeds that unless they go through fire... 
they can never grow. That's a really Australian thing. There's a lot of seeds like that. There are some plants that if you don't take them out of the pot they're in and put them either in a bigger pot or new soil or more sun, they will never grow. We're a bit like that. Movement can be painful. It can hurt. But sometimes it's the only way that we can grow and that we can reseed. And sometimes in our church, we need to review our key ideas. And so, sometimes you can go to conferences or you can see things on telly or whatever, and it sounds like you're at a business conference, um, you know, where the market determines what we do and what, what, where we go. Um, things like, you know, um, managing risk or um, uh, return on investment. And these tend to be guiding principles rather than um, the language and the ideas of the Bible. We absolutely need to be good stewards of what we have, but we also need it to be guided by an authentic full gospel message, not a gospel that we recreate in our own image because it makes us feel comfortable. You can read in Hebrews 11, it's the great faith chapter. Okay, These are the people that we, like it was lovely, thank you everyone, when Cass made me stand up and say, hi everyone, you all clap, that, that makes you feel good, all right? <laughs> you say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, Hebrews 11 is a bit like that. Okay, Moses did this, woo, yeah. And then, um, you know, David did this, yeah, isn't he amazing? But the back end is full of people with no names. They never got to re write the book, Five Keys to Being a Millionaire, or, you know, Seven Things to Do to Be Healthy, Wealthy and Wise, or, boy, you've made it if you do the nine things that I've outlined in this book. You know why? Because they had great faith. What happened to them? They got boiled in oil, sawed in half, thrown to the lions, Ab abject poverty, hunger, starvation, hiding in caves, and yet they're commended for their faith. They're the seeds that went through fire, and we're here today because of them. So we need to get back to the word on some of these ideas about enacting justice. Sometimes when we're um, you know, together, it's good to take the role and see who's here. It's great you guys are here. I'm glad you're here. I'd be lonely without you. But if you're a teacher and you mark the role, sometimes there are people that are not there. And we give a code, don't we, Laura? We sort of say they're absent without a reason or, you know, um, Dad sent a text to say they're late again, so I'll put that down or, you know, uh, no idea where they are. We have these little things. And that the present absences is good for us as a church globally to go, okay, it's great to see who's here, but it's good to take the role and see who's not here because that matters because we're all God's children and it's not us and them, they're all us. God made a way for them who aren't here today equally. So how do we build that bridge how do we move out from behind the walls? I think that's the big challenge. We're all. I'm going to tell a story for them. And people like Pastor Alan and Pastor Jill who are sitting here, um, I'm, I'm going to jump to something just, just to diverge a little bit. But this thing about enacting justice, this is a cause that people like Pastor Alan and Pastor Jill have given their life to because there's this burning sense of enacting justice on the earth within them sometimes we get messed up can we just go to um, slide nine please sometimes we get a little bit messed up um, in in the church historically um, I want to tell you a story about a man named Dr Charles Jewgood okay so he founded the Ernabella mission back in the 30s. The reason he did that, so he was a head surgeon at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. He was a lay member of the Presbyterian Church Board. And South Australia didn't have what other states called a protector of Aborigines, but he was sort of it. His job was to go and check on how Aboriginal people were faring as cattle and other interests started to sort of spread out across Australia. And, um, you know, in his day, a thing called um, social Darwinism was still a dominant idea. 
Now, if you don't know what social Darwinism is, don't worry, because none of the first years in my class in teaching and learning Aboriginal studies at university had ever heard of it either. So, um, basically, it's this. Darwin said that there's a, a, a great chain of being, and if you're white like me, you're at the top of the ladder. You're more evolved and somehow superior. But then it goes down, right? And the rungs go down. And the problem is, is that the bottom rung of the ladder has apes and Aboriginal people sharing the bottom rung. Now, the world was captured by this, absolutely captured, and so was the church. So for some churches, uh, here we are busy at the front of abolishing slavery, for example, a really important thing, but then, okay, so we accept the black slave as our brother, but we want to kind of, you know, establish ourselves on the land and there's Aboriginal people there, so, hmm... What are we going to do about that? Some people kind of said, oh, well, maybe they're lesser humans, so we're not really doing bad things because they're not really people. Okay? That's what some Christians were saying to themselves. Some churches had really screwed up ideology because they got mixed up with this worldly um, view uh, and the gospel. Others we can be so grateful for, and, and Karirka and her family here, you know, their grandparents... Um, probably they're sitting here today because there were Christians who were willing to say, actually, that's wrong. That is just plain, flat wrong. So you look at the books, you know, in the sort of 1930s through to 1970s, you know, the passing of the Aborigines, that's a classic one. They're not really fully evolved, so they'll all be dead soon, so don't worry. So we'll enact charity, will be nice, that's called smoothing the dying pillow, but they won't be here in a generation. That was what people who are out there, you know, in Christian mission and service and charity were thinking. I like the, I think Charles Dugard deliberately chose the title of his book, No Dying Race, as a way to speak back to that idea. Okay? That is reasserting the humanity of Aboriginal people as equal brothers with full and equal access to God the Father. And, um, you know, he... he uh, uh, set down some rules that I'm sure when Alan and Jill were at Ernabella, you know, those ideas about the way that you work and respect with people were probably still continuing generations later. And, um, uh, you know, this is a, that's, that's my father-in-law there sitting on the uh, bonnet of that old car that probably doesn't surprise anyone who ever knew him that he's sitting on a Kingswood or something. That's probably typical. Um, but Dugard really uh, advocated on a range of justice issues like... Um, the welfare of Aboriginal people. You know that the British government exploded a whole pile of nuclear bombs in the middle of South Australia um, in, in the 50s and, and towards the 60s, and he, he was advocating on issues about that, uh, the things like the 1967 referendum, which led to communities being able to actually have a voice and run their own business. So it's a switch in ideology. But, you know, Jugood was there for decades, and he was working from this idea that God has a redemptive plan for everyone. He is calling all of us back to him and that we are brothers and sisters and equals. I wonder if there's any do-goods here. So you don't have to be a pastor or a full-time minister, be on a salary, have a platform or a YouTube channel to change the reality of the world for others, to be enacting God's justice. Dugard was a full-time full surgeon. He actually never lived at Unabella. He just had a vision that managed to send and resource. He sent seeds out over and over. Young people here, I hope you get a really powerful vision of how to enact godly justice on the earth. Build bridges. And you know what the best thing is? Because I'm going to talk in a minute about the problems that happen when we go to Google or social media, but you know, you've got a great resource of people that have lived this stuff out. You can sit down with them and say, I want to talk to you about this, can you help me? You've got older people, you've got youth leaders, you've got pastors. That is the best way to start to shape that seed, to start to form those ideas about what God's calling you to, and maybe there's a new way to understand what a biblical notion of justice is all about that God's calling you to. Take back the language. Don't sit there and 
tweet about SJWs, social justice warriors, whatever, take the language, right? Reframe it. Put back God at the front because it's God's language in the first place. So here's the problem that we, we have as um, people. Can we go to the next slide there? Um, some of you know my good friend Paul Force, and uh, he, he loves podcasts and social media and all that, so he sends me lots of stuff to read and listen to, which I really enjoy. Last year he set me up on Twitter. I don't think that's a good idea on reflection. But um, anyway, this was about in August and I didn't know how to do it. So he said, what we'll do is we'll set up my Twitter account to mirror, your, your account to mirror mine. And the way you do it is you follow different people, okay? So in August, we both have exactly the same Twitter account, okay? We're listening to the same voices. We're reading the same material. We're getting the same views on everything. And then, of course, something pops up and then you like it or you read it or you share it. That's sort of how it works. And to give you a view, an idea on how powerful the algorithms are at locating you within a very narrow tribe and a very narrow view of the world, and you, they put you behind a wall and they want to make you have a very powerful sense of who's us and who's them. And not just to make lots of thems, but then shoot them down in flames. And it's very, very exciting. It's very reinforcing of who you really are. It makes you feel like you belong. But it's not God's way. It's not God's archive that we're positioning ourselves from. And you have to either be very, very good at gardening. That means unfollowing, un, you know, reading or whatever and trying some other things or knowing how to read different sources or be a very, very good critical thinker to read, okay, why are they saying this? What are they, res what are they referring to? Whose interests do they represent? If you're really good at that, it can't, it can't, it, you can take the power away from some of that. But if you're not, it's important for you to understand how powerful this stuff is. And I'll tell you why. In November, a little moment happened. There was about nine seconds. If you know this clip, you'll know the story, right? For about nine seconds, some video footage went viral, okay? And I happened to be talking to Paul. And um, what's happening here is that there's a group. Is there any teachers here? Okay, good. I love you. And you'll get this, right? So there's a group of year nine boys from a Catholic school. And they're in Washington Square. They're at a, um, a rally. And there's a whole pile of um, groups in the square who are protesting and rallying about a range of things. Now, at one point, this old Native American Indian man, he comes with a drum towards the boys and they sort of surround him. And this one boy in particular stands in his way and he's just standing there. So, so I said to Paul, what, what are you seeing? And uh, because you see what my Twitter was telling me was that um, you know this was um, uh, you know a highly racially charged? It was a, a, an acting violence against this old man, very disrespectful. And uh, you know I work with a lot of um, Aboriginal and um, you know scholars of colour around the world, and so they are saying you know we've seen this, we know how this feels, and it was very very powerful, very um, important to them. And and. Paul said, yeah, yeah, I've read all about that. Um, it's all fake news. And that old man attacked a group of um, innocent boys. I went, what? I didn't see anything about that. He said, yeah, 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 it's all over the Twitter. I said, not on my Twitter. So then over the next few days, as the story unfolded and all the details come out, we're sort of going, we're ringing each other up and we're saying, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? You know, it became obvious to me that we are getting completely opposite views of reality. Completely opposite. It took three months from exactly the same to this means something completely different. Now, the great thing is that Paul and I have a great relationship and we can talk and we can work it through. But imagine if I say, well, Paul, you're just a this and that. And he goes, well, you're just a this and that we can actually be out of fellowship and on the wrong page and actually turning us into them and going each other. And that's not God's way. 
So just go to the next page if you can. I mean, these are the kind of some of the things that started to come out over the next few days um, to help you in the safety of your wall to feel completely justified as you're lighting fire to the arrows you're about to fire over the turrets at everyone else. And um, I mean, I, look, I did about four hours work on this um, and tried to get a lot of sources. I watched the whole thing. Um, and my summary of the situation is where on earth were the teachers? So if you're a teacher and you leave um, a group of year nine boys unsupervised in a public protest space for an hour and a half, I'll tell you something, bad things are going to happen, all right? Um, so that's my summary of the scenario. But you can see the division and the damage that can happen if you let yourself be positioned in the world by an algorithm or other interests. So you need to get positioned by God and his biblical notion of who you are, where you fit in the world and what justice is all about. Church, we've got to get out front with this message. Okay, we don't, don't worry about, uh, um, look, I'm an equity scholar at university. The people I sit with are Islamic scholars, indigenous scholars, Marxists, um, feminist scholars, and I love all of them to bits. You know why? Because they're deeply committed to enacting justice in the world, right? Now, the best thing about that is that the Bible is such a great source document and God put the language there first and he is the original social justice advocate. And so uh, it's been a magnificent way to actually witness to intellectuals um, from very different perspectives in a very unexpected uh, way. Um, but I just love God's word and his heart and it comes out. Uh, you can try and recoin it and rephrase it, but God put it there first. So two ways you can deal with it. One, if you have a difference or a fallout or there's a problem or we're us and you're them, you can take Paul's approach. So Peter, interestingly, in some translations they call him Cephas here, but it is Peter. Why did they call Peter Cephas? Because the early um, Catholic Church didn't want their, their, their foundation pope to come out looking bad on the side of an argument. So in some translations, he's Peter, and in many others, he's Cephas here to try and obfuscate. Church, if institutionally we've caused damage because we're wrong, own it, put your name to it, and let's fix it. That's what enacting justice is about. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so Paul, and I just want to, you can read this later, this is in Galatians 2, has to confront Peter because Peter is having wonderful dinners with Gentiles until his Orthodox Jew buddies are in town and then he observes Orthodox Jewish law and won't go near the Gentiles. Paul says, uh-uh, because he has a revelation of grace. He remembers the curtain being open for all. He hasn't forgotten and that means something to him so he confronts Peter in front of everyone so that's one way you can deal with difference or problems or issues you can confront someone in front of everyone I would like to um, take a lead from the women here can we um, just go through next slide please thank you um, and go one more there was a man called Apollos and he was really sincere, preaching a great gospel, but he only knew about the baptism in, uh, through John. He, he didn't know about baptism through Jesus. And it took two incredible women who Paul calls his co-workers, who risked their lives for him, and the churches. And the churches are actually meeting in their house. These are pretty savvy, powerful, influential women. Now, they don't confront in Paul's way you know what they do they invite Apollos to their home and they explain him the way of God more adequately and I reckon that's a little way we can go about it isn't it if we have a problem if we have a disagreement if there's an issue um, if we're wrestling with something where we don't always agree that's a great little model why don't you invite someone for a coffee Right? That's, what, that's what Paul and I do, actually, because he reads different stuff to me and we, we have a coffee. And um, I explain to him the way of God more adequately. Oh, no, I mean, yeah. 
Oh, humility, that's right. No. Um, dialogue, that's what the previous, you know, it's about dialogue and relationship. That's the way out of this. Um, step away from your algorithms. Get to know. Look, I'm looking around at wonderful, inspiring, mature, balanced Christians here. If you're a young person here, have a coffee with these guys. Build a relationship. Dialogue is about talking and listening. That's going to change the world. I'm going to finish there, but I just want to issue a couple of things. Sometimes when there's us and them, you belong, but you don't. That really hurts. And some of you sitting here this morning have been on the outside of a wall, whether that's by people in the church or by um, just, you know what, human nature. We all want to feel comfortable and so we make walls and we make us's and we make them's. That's human nature. It's not God's nature, but it is human nature. And as we do that, there are casualties. And I'm aware that some of us feel absolutely bruised at times, that sometimes we feel our value is crushed or our hopes and dreams seem less valid or they're not resourced or encouraged or celebrated and that's hurtful. But I want you to think about that curtain. I want you to think about that moment at the cross that Laura was leading us in. Something powerful happened that changed history and the, tur the curtain was torn in two and you have full and free equal access to an intimate relationship with God and you are equally loved, equally valid, valued, celebrated, resourced, gifted by God who is your father as well as mine. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter if you're sick, doesn't matter if uh, you, know, you have a passport or not, all of that doesn't matter. We are all brothers and sisters and we're equal and that's what God's word says. I would uh, like to invite you, if, if you feel that that's been an issue for you, you can be released of that today. There are pastors here. We're going to sing. Laura, would you bring the team up? And we're going to sing. And as we close, you might need to actually step through that torn curtain and re-engage with God, your Heavenly Father. And I also want to encourage those of you who are thinking, now I've put a fair bit of content in there. I know that today. Lots of ideas and technical terms and blah, 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 blah. Okay, um, we sort of need a four-hour workshop to unpack it later, and um, that's, that's okay. But what I'm hoping is that I've stirred something in some of you that you'll start rethinking. So you'll, you'll start to see little stories where people are going, this is right, it should be fixed, this is wrong, whether it's in a Christian sense or not, and be led by God about how you're going to enact, enact justice God's justice on the earth. I mean, you guys have seen the Avengers movies, right? I mean, imagine being an agent of justice. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I don't know if you'd have a shield or she would have a sword. But I like the idea of being an agent of justice, but of true, authentic, God-ordained, biblical justice. Because that's the power that's going to change the world. That's the bridge building that we all need to be participating in. That's what God's calling us to. Uh, think about Jugud, who was a surgeon, who had a deep justice-oriented vision uh, for protecting and supporting Aboriginal people who were being obliterated by... Actually, people's cows were prioritised over Aboriginal people. That's, that's what was happening. Uh, he, he rushed back here in 1936 and he stopped the South Australian government from issuing the whole top half of South Australia to, to turn them into cattle stations. Um, and that has an intergenerational impact. That had a vision that the likes of Pastor Alan and Pastor Jill were willing to sow their lives into and move from New South Wales to sow into that vision. You guys can have an intergenerational vision right now. And it can be God-ordained. And it can be rethinking notions of God's justice being enacted on the earth. But you need to be positioned by God and by his word 
not by your social media, your, your you know, Twitter feed or whatever you guys, I know Twitter and Facebook's old people's stuff, but you need to be positioned by God. We all do, okay? That's really important. So I want to challenge you and we're going to pray and I'm going to hand over to Cass.